the theory is so important. The flying uh, side of things is a skill, it's something that you build with experience. But the theory side really is what will aid your decision making process uh, in, in the first place. So if you can make quicker and better reactions based on your theoretical knowledge, then you will have become a more rounded pilot. So bear with us on some of the stuff that we do go through. Yes, it might be a bit uh, old or a bit, say, beneath you, but certainly something you learned a long time ago. But certainly a refresher of the <coughs> basics um, is really, really important. Both myself, Andy and Barry, obviously we're doing all of this uh, free of charge. Um, there's no subscription, there is no license fee, we're not emailing you afterwards, so we are purely doing this uh, free of charge uh, for you guys so you've got something to do. It is our plan to try and do these every other day, we can't guarantee that that will be the case, but we're going to try to do that uh, every other day, 7pm UK time. Um, mm -hmm. And what can I say, wow, over a hundred thousand uh, reach so far. 100,000 people is just unbelievable. Um, thank you. You know, the, uh, a lot of people watch us live, and again, one of the real questions we've had is why are we doing them live? Um, and again, it gives us something to do, it gives you something to do. It's a it's way for us to have a chat on the forums and, uh, and speak on the stream. So, you know, please feel free if a question pops up that, and you want to answer it. Me and Andy and Barry do go through all the comments. Uh, we do read them, negative. Actually, we haven't had any negative comments other than sound quality. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, maybe we're doing something right, which would be good. Um, so yes, if we can get back to you and reply to them, that'd be great. And uh, again, some of the private messages that we've had uh, as well, we do read those. It's myself and Andy that do reply to them. We've had messages from people in the States, pretty much everywhere in Europe, and I was talking to a guy in Puerto Rico uh, the other day uh, about meteorology. Fantastic, what can I say? Um, got to say hello to our India friends. We, uh, Barry was out in India um, last year uh, with one of our uh, TIs, um, and I believe, as long as the world goes normal, that uh, we're going back out there this year. Keep an eye out on some of the things that we will be doing uh, throughout the year when we get back airborne, because we're all going to want to get airborne as quickly as possible. Obviously, when we're talking air law, which we're doing today, there is quite a few people that are worried about things like revalidations, um, and aircraft permits. Um, certainly for myself, I'm a BMEA instructor. There is a lot of information coming out from the BMEA, um, and certainly speak to your instructor um, and speak to your flying school or flying club because the information that we are getting is being put out there. Uh, obviously check the source because there's also a lot of misinformation. So either go directly to the BMEA or read the CAA websites. Um, and like I say, you know, there's, uh, there's information that's coming out. As soon as it is confirmed and we have a defin definitive answer, well, it looks like we're also a great portal for getting that information out as well. So once we do have information to share, we will share that with you. But we're certainly not in the mood to start giving you maybes, what ifs, could be's, uh, and couldn'ts. Um, okay, um, are we good to go? Yeah, good. Right. What we're going to do then is we're going to be switching things up today. So I'm doing the intro, and Andy is going to be taking today's lesson. He's um, going to be talking to you about air law. Um, obviously, air law in itself, fantastic subject, one of my favourites. Um, it's quite a huge subject, so we've decided to take a few s a snippets which is relevant to everybody. If your feet leave the ground, this is relevant to you. Um, so again, enjoy uh, this session from Andy, um, and I'll see you at the end. Bye. Hello and good evening. So, air law. <clears throat> So we're going to break air law, like Mark says, down to snippets and try and cover something for everyone. The first part, um, air law within the UK is written in a book that's called the Air Navigation Order. Okay, um, That covers all civil aviation within the UK. It doesn't cover military. They are self-governed. So the Air Navigation Order book covers everything. 
Um, what we're going to do first off is what is probably seen as the essential rules of the air. And these are um, classifications of aircraft and collision avoidance. So that's what we'll be looking at tonight for different aircraft collision avoidance and classifications within air law. So first of all, let's look at classifications of aircraft. This is um, as in right of ways, okay? So your first classification of aircraft that we all must avoid are balloons, as in hot air balloons. Yeah, they can can't re, they can't be governed where they're going. They have their flight plan of where they're going to go with the wind. They can go up and down, but not very quickly. So we need to avoid balloons. Two is gliders. Now within gliders, yeah, we have sailplanes is what people traditionally see as a glider, big wings on. We have hangies or hang gliders. Paragliders and paramotors. Paramotors are classed as gliders. Within paramotors as well, obviously with the uh, deregulation and, and within uh, hang gliders or self propelled hang gliders, you've got the sub 70 class, which is also classed as a glider. So even some things now with wheels are classed as paramotors, as gliders. So <coughs> classification. The next one is, is, is uh, I'd say they come out, yeah, airships. Airships, because they are propelled through the air and they are more maneuverable. And number four, five, are, number four is one that a lot of people might miss out, is aircraft, aircraft towing a glider. So an aircraft towing a glider is the next classification. And that's whether it's a, a sailplane or a hang glider. Yeah. And the next one are aircraft being the most manoeuvrable and having the ability to climb, descend left and right. So that's your classifications. So if you're flying a glider, you must avoid a balloon. If it's your airship must avoid colliders and balloons and on and upwards. Okay? So they are classifications. What we're going to look at now are the right hand rules or collision avoidance rules. Within paragliding, hang gliding, we've always called them the right hand rules. <clears throat> so the clue is in the name, right. And I'm going to do basically eight, eight of those, okay? Number one, yeah, is, and what I'll do, I'll draw the picture <clears throat> as a triangle, a bit like a delta wing or a flex wing or a hang glider, yeah? And the pointy bit is going forwards, okay? So we've got another pointy one coming this way, going forwards. So two aircraft, and this is two aircraft, this doesn't matter if you're on a paraglider, head on with a glider, a glider, head on with a powered aircraft, yeah, uh, powered aircraft, head on with a paramotor, 
Yeah, so Ne2, yeah. Um, so if you head on with another aircraft, both aircraft should turn to the right. Yeah, so head on, we both turn to the right. And the, these rules you should know really when you're in the air without thinking about them. Okay? The next one we're going to do is converging aircraft. So two aircraft converging. The one that is on the right is in the right. So this pilot is in the right. So we're converging like so. The pilot on the right is in the right and this pilot should take action yeah, to avoid the other pilot. It doesn't mean he has to turn around and fly all the way to outer Mongolia but you must avoid the other pilot. Okay, So on the converge, yeah, if you're on the right, you're in the right. Now let's look at overtaking another aircraft. And this is out in open airspace. Okay, so overtaking another aircraft. This is where it slightly differs between types of aircraft. So if this aircraft wishes to overtake this aircraft, and both these aircraft are powered aircraft, as in a Michaelite or a GA or any other sort of powered aircraft, this aircraft should overtake on the right hand side of the other aircraft. The reason being, traditionally, <coughs> is a pilot of a powered aircraft sits on the left hand side of the aircraft. So he's this side of the aircraft. So as he overtakes, hey, you don't see that happen on the BBC, do you? <laughs> as he overtakes, yeah, he, he should have full view of this aircraft all the time because this pilot would not have seen this pilot. Okay, so overtake on the right. Now, with a glider, we can overtake either side. So, overtake on the right and side of the other aircraft. Gliders are both sides. <clears throat> Let's talk about um, paragliders, hang gliders, gliders on a ridge and overtaking. Now, it was always at one point, if we have a, a ridge here, and here we have two pilots bobbing along, but Joe here is on a super fan dangle, super fast wing, and uh, old Bill here, he's only been in the sport for a few hours, he's got his nice, slow, easy safe wing. It was always recommended that to overtake, you would overtake on the inside, on the ridge side. That changed within the BHPA, the British Angle and Paragliding Association, uh, a few years back, where the recommend, recommendation changed for that. The reason they always said ridge side was, 
if you were sawing a ridge and the wind's coming onto the ridge this way, yeah, so here's your ridge, yeah, you would always turn away from a ridge. You'd never turn with the wind towards a ridge. So the chances that the pilot might turn into you because he hasn't looked before he's turned were lessened by the fact that you would always turn away from the ridge. So you would always turn, go the ridge side to overtake. The recommendation now is not to overtake, is to actually, if you think you're going to overtake someone, is actually to turn back away from that pilot. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, overtake on the ridge. The recommendation is not to. Yeah, it was to overtake on the inside <coughs> or the ridge side at one time. Let's do another one that probably won't apply to most um, power pilots. If you are head on whilst ridge sawing with another glider, there's your ridge. The pilot with the ridge on their right is in the right. So the pilot with the ridge on their right is in the right. So in this scenario this pilot would be in the right and this pilot should move out to allow this pilot back, uh, past. So if the, if the ridge is on the right you're in right. And that one? Any comments? Anything Everyone's glued. Oh, they're glued. Oh, they're glued or bored. All 94 of them. Oh, they're glued or bored. Oh, that's two of them. Uh, next one is landing. On landing. Who has right of way on landing? Um, it is simply the aircraft that is lowest. So the lowest aircraft has right of way. And it doesn't matter. I know a lot of us share ridges with different classifications. So uh, on, a, on a busy site uh, like the Long Mins, uh, which is a very top landable site for paragliders and hang gliders. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're on a hang glider or a paraglider. Uh, the, it is the lowest one has right of way. So it's the same with the powered aircraft, the lowest has right of way. So landing is the lowest. Simple as that. Once again, back to um, gliders, thermals. So entering a thermal. The first person in to the thermal can decide which way they turn. So if you've entered the thermal, if someone's entered the thermal and they're going to the right or in a clockwise direction and you wish to enter that thermal, then you must enter that thermal and also turn in a clockwise direction. Same goes if you turn anti-clockwise. Uh, the only difference there being that I know there are some certain, certain areas, some certain clubs that they insist that within an area you do right hand or clockwise or you do left hand anti-clockwise uh, thermaline. Also within competitions the start cylinder may be defined that you must turn right or you must turn left <coughs> within a thermal and that's local sites. So that's the point of actually, if you're a member of a club or you're visiting a site that you haven't visited before, that you should abide and find out 
the rules for that site. But mostly it's a free fall, and the first one in who's lucky enough to find the thermal, <coughs> or good enough to find the thermal first, yeah, will decide which way they prefer to thermal, and they will decide that, and they will decide thermal direction. If you watch a flock of seagulls thermaling, or a flock of birds, they all turn in the same direction, usually except for one. He's using the comp pilot. Russian, Russian. Yeah? Who's a... Oh, Russian. Oh, oh, Russian, Paris oh, says. <laughs> we got any Russians in tonight? <laughs> so, thermal is uh, first in. Yeah, decides. Direction is the norm. First in decides. The person, the people that are entering the thermal, yeah, it's really up to them to enter the thermal in a fashion that will not cause collision. So once the person's in the thermal, yeah, it's up to you to enter the thermal in a fashion that will not cause a collision or com compromise the other pilots. And it's the same can be said for leaving the thermal as well. Yeah, you shouldn't make sharp turns out of the thermal when leaving a thermal <coughs> unless you know there's no one else around you. Yeah, it should be a steady movement out of the thermal away from any other pilots that may be in that thermal. Can we have a recap on the ridge scenario for us when one person is following another? Overtaking? Yeah, or oh, pass, passing. Somebody asked for that. Trying to get in front of the other person. Okay. <coughs> the current recommendation, or the current the way the BHPA, the British Hang Glider and Paraglider Association, have put this for hang gliders and paragliders, it was at one point, yeah, if the ridge is here, it doesn't matter if you're going which way you're going, yeah, so we'll do going that way, yeah, so old Billy here is flying a much faster wing, yeah, so he's catching the wing in front of. Uh, <clears throat> it used to be always overtaking ridge side and the reason the thinking behind that and this is the this was in the UK yeah so this is this is UK based it was always ridge side and the thinking was yeah that anyone who was ridge soaring would never turn towards the ridge because the chances of getting blown very quickly into the ridge it was always that a pilot would turn away from a ridge as they come down here they would turn the opposite way away from the ridge so if you were always overtaking on the ridge side the chances are that they wouldn't turn towards you because you're in their blind spot so if you're coming up behind a paraglide pilot he's got a very big blind spot behind him yeah? he's also got a blind spot above him a hand glider pilot has got a very big blind spot above it and we should never ever overtake any aircraft directly above or directly below them or that close that it may cause a collision if they were to turn. So a wide berth is a good berth. Never directly above and never directly below because that pilot doesn't know if he's, all, if he's going to climb really quickly or descend really quickly at any point and neither do you. So it was always ridge side. They changed that a few years back to say it is best not to overtake at all and actually turn away to give that pilot space. So the recommendation is not to overtake on the ridge. This is for uh, hang gliders and paragliders. I don't know about gliders. If there's any glider pilots watching, uh, please feel free to comment. I don't know about gliders. That's hang gliders and paragliders, the recommendation for that. Uh, number eight <coughs> is Number eight is quite simple. It's to avoid 
collision, avoid collision at all costs. If you're head on with me and you turn left, I bet I won't turn right, I will turn left. If you're converging with me, I and I am on the right, so I'm in the right, I can bet that I will not presume that you've seen me. If we're head on on a ridge and that ridge is on my right, you can bet that I will not presume that you have seen me even though we're head on facing each other. People have done it. There's, there was a case a few years back in the Peak District of a low air time pilot who got the ridge on their right, there was a more experienced pilot coming the other way and they connected. Luckily neither of them were hurt and questioned afterwards the low air time pilot says well I had the ridge on my right, I was in the right of way. And the other pilot says I was uh, I was distracted at the time, I'd seen some people start to turn and I kept looking and seeing if they were climbing, see if I could go there and I turned around and went, oh, and it was too late. So never presume that someone's seen you, never presume that they know their right hand rules. Yeah? Happy with those. Well, you guys got those, any questions? Through on those. Larry's been on, said that sailplanes will overtake on the ridge side. <coughs> sailplane, it's still within glide that sailplanes will overtake on the ridge side. Thank you very much, Larry. Yeah, <coughs> like I say, it was changed within paragliding and hang oh, gliding a few years back. John, uh, P. Allen, the BGA changed the rules to be the same for ridge soaring. I'm assuming that means same as ridge soaring for paragliding. Yeah. Okay, so to turn away, not to overtake on the ridge side. Okay, lovely. There you go, I've learnt something. Great stuff. Any more? No, this one here, the BHP handbook, was not updated regarding the overtaking rule on the ridge. Get a new copy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're correct. I actually did look today to see. This is one of the latest copies, actually, and it has not been updated. It has not been updated. Okay. <clears throat> so that, that's one of the, that is one of the latest, that's the third edition, it might be one of the latest ones, but I, I look today, it probably is because we get quite a few of them in from the BHPA, we buy them in, the students. Okay. <clears throat> the, um, a lot of the stuff, it doesn't cover a lot of the paragliding and hang gliding, is this, if I can bring it into... Yeah. Okay, the Skyway Code covers a lot of the basic essentials within air law. This you can download for free from the CAA website, from the Civil Aviation website. You can download this for free. Yeah, and it's got a lot of the basic essentials concerning the air law if you want to keep yourself up to date with air law. Somebody passed a comment the other day I, when we were doing navigation IFR. IFR, I follow roads and I follow rivers, I follow railways, I follow anything beginning with R. A lot of us do. A lot of us follow a lot of things called R because they're great landmarks. I mentioned that we've got the A50 down the road here, yeah, which is a dual carriageway. Uh, goes basically from Nottingham uh, through to Stoke and it's a great, very, very easy to follow. So if you were following that road, which side would the road be on? It would be on your left hand side. Or as they put it, you, the aircraft will be on the right hand side of the landmark. Which I think is a lot more confusing than saying if you're sitting in a plane keep the landmark on your left hand side. Once again, the easy way to remember that is that usually a pilot of an aircraft, the P1, the captain, will be sitting on the left hand side of the aircraft, yeah, so you can see the landmark. So if we all follow that rule, yeah, down here, then 
everyone is flying with that and people coming the other way I follow that. So landmarks to be kept on your left hand side. Of course that's easy if you're in a powered aircraft, a Michael Light or a GA aircraft, if we're in gliders, we don't tend to follow landmarks, <coughs> we follow the sky. Yeah, so we're out following the cloud streets. So if you want to know, as a, a general aviation pilot, where a glider will be, where paragliders will be, where hang gliders will be on a lovely day, look straight down a cloud street yeah, and don't fly down it because that's where they'll be and you don't want to come head on with a glider that's clocking along at 150 knots because he's having such a good day out. <clears throat> so landmarks you keep on your left. The other side of that as well, if everyone's flying landmarks and they're flying down roads and so forth, if you're crossing a major, a good landmark like the A50, like a good railway or a good river, then as you cross it, yeah, extra eyes open. Peel them eyeballs open because that is the motorway in the sky. Yeah, whenever I cross the A50, my head is like it's on the stick more than I normally am, like my head is on a stick. Yeah, I'm looking for the traffic coming from Derby through towards Stoke so they can pick up the M1 and go north. <coughs> because that's what people do. Uh, we had a question earlier, can, can somebody asked as a paramotor pilot, can you use um, uh, our field to fly from? The answer is yes, you do have to become a, a member uh, to fly from here and you must be insured to fly from here as a paramotor pilot. Yeah? So you must have a BHPA rating to actually fly from here as well. Um, <clears throat> it can be a club pilot rating, the first rating you get, uh, but you can use the airfield once we're out and flying and you can become a member. Uh, you must come and get briefed on our site and how to use the airfield as safe as possible and noise abatement at Darley Moor as well. Because like all airfields, we have got a noise abatement in place to keep friends as we can, as much friends as we can, with our neighbours. Yeah. So the answer is yes. Uh, 500 foot rule. Well, here is a good one that some people probably know and don't like using, but it is in place. The 500 foot rule. Which when you think about it, isn't a lot. 500 foot isn't very far, is it? So, I'll draw my plane here, look. It doesn't matter what aircraft it is, the 500 foot rule counts. And here's the building. Here's the ship. Here's the person. So the 500 foot rule states you must be at least 500 feet away from any vehicle. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's do a Noddy's car. Look, here we go. I've got a joke about Noddy, but I'm not allowed to tell it. Here we go. You must be 500 feet away from a vehicle, vessel, person or structure. Except if you're taking off and landing. Or a glider that is ridge soaring. Yes, you can get prosecuted for it, and yes, it's becoming a lot more common. Yeah, uh, yeah, they can take your license like this, look, and do that, and go, ta-da, <coughs> there goes your license, 
I know what a lot of you are thinking, I haven't got a licence because I fly a barrow motor. The 500 foot rule was put in place for the protection of not only the public, it was put in place for the protection of the pilot as well. If you have an engine failure at 500 feet, that is not very high. That is seconds before you have to land. Not minutes, it's seconds before you have to land. So if you're passing over an area where the landing is not very good, even for a paramotor, which with enough practice, you will, you could land it on a tennis court, ten times out of ten. But you are passing over an area where you cannot land it. <clears throat> it's going to hurt. So the 500 foot rule is there to force pilots higher than 500 feet to protect themselves and other people. It's just not there for so we don't um, <clears throat> upset people because of the noise, or annoy people because of the noise. It's there as a protection for them and for yourself. I think very importantly within the paramotoring, when you look at the incidents out there, and the serious accidents, and the fatalities out there, the majority of them do come with pilots that are flying around really low. If you have a collapse on your wing, low down, below 300 feet, especially if you're flying it very fast or very highly loaded, so you've got a small wing that's highly loaded and you take a collapse on it, 300 feet is not enough height to get a parachute out. It's over. Yeah, you are into the ground in moments and you are going to hit the ground at over 60 miles an hour. So what you've got to ask yourself is, if you were riding your motorbike, would you jump off it at 60 miles an hour on purpose? I think for the majority of us that have got any sort of self-preservation, the answer is no. So the 500 foot rule is in place to protect everyone. So. You're not allowed within 500 feet of any vehicle, vessel, person or structure except for the purposes of taking off and landing and a glider when ridge soaring. It's the 500 foot rule. Rights away on the ground. This won't apply to everyone, but it will apply to some people. So, rights of way on the ground. Who has rights of way on the ground? So, the first right of way is uh, number one is an aircraft. Take off landing. So any aircraft that is taking off or landing has right of way. That's the overall. The next one is an aircraft. So an aircraft that is moving around an airfield as right away, but must give way to any aircraft that is landing or taking off. The next one is a vehicle towing an aircraft. A 
my next one is a vehicle. A vehicle. Must give way to everyone. Mark Cox, yes please, we'd love a couple of bot uh, cases of beer dropped off at the end of the driveway. Is that a necessary journey? <laughs> What's he asking? He's doing? saying would we like some boxes of beers dropping off at the end of the drive. <laughs> Does that class as a necessary journey? Yes. <laughs> keep, keep social distance and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, George Holmes has asked, would a parachute deploy in, fi uh, in time from 500 feet? Thinking time I think is the problem there, isn't it? If you look at um, the deployments, and there's a lot of now with um, with camera technology, phone technology, GoPros, we're seeing a lot more videos of uh, reserve deployments. You've got two friends in aviation, two real friends in aviation. One is speed, and one is height. They are your best friends. If you, if you show me the incident, I'll tell you whether you get a parachute out in time. There are people that have deployed parachutes very low and they've worked. As soon as a parachute starts to open, it starts to slow you down and that may be enough that you survive it. If you if you have a mid-air with another paramotors, two paramotors, and you have a mid-air with each other at 500 feet, the pursuing chaos may mean you won't get a parachute out because it will be chaos. Yeah, you'll be upside down, inside out, and will you get a parachute out at 500 feet? Probably not. If you mid-air a glider at 500 feet, uh, that glider is going to hit you really hard and really fast with a thin piece of wing section. You might not be capable of getting a parachute out, or you may have to use the opposite hand because your right hand's broken. You've got to get that parachute out. The glider pilot, 500 feet, won't get out. So the answer is not to me there and not to muck around low. Is the real answer to that question? People have done it. You know, through no fault of their own, they've lost control of a wing, low down, and they've managed to get a shootout. The sooner you decide to throw your parachute, the better, because you've got more height to sort the rest of your life out before you meet the planet. So throwing high is much better. It gives you time. It gives the time for the parachute to work properly, and it gives you time to get out your harness, get your legs down, but it gives you time to actually get out of the aircraft that just became wreckage. That is the real answer, is that height is your friend in, in all scenarios. Yeah. Any more questions on that? Not really many, no. <coughs> okay, do you want to do any more, Mark? Just moving on, do you want to do some uh, visual stuff? Uh, yeah, do, sure. Do you want to do some of that? Do you want to do that? Yeah. Oh. I think they're on about changing this slot. They've just changed micro lighting from 3K down to the same as parameters, one and a half. Have they? It'd be worth mentioning. Yeah. Okay. Wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> no, it's not a lot, is it? So, we'll just to finish off, we'll just do some uh, visual flight rules, which is. Uh, So we're just going to go through some visual flight rules. Yep. Lovely. I need my glasses on. Oh, what have I done with glasses? Well prepared me, haven't I? I could run, I'll, I'll run blind on each other. It's got it that my quads are part of 1,500, doesn't it? So, visual flight rules. So we've got the ground here. We've got the ground here. We've 
got 3,000 feet. So we've got flight rules below and above 3,000 feet. And we're going to stick a cloud here. Okay, everyone can see that. Ah, oh, look, they've got a cloud here as well. So, an aircraft should be. This is not in controlled airspace, this is class G, like G and F airspace. And D, class D airspace. Uh, an aircraft should be to be within VMC or visual flight rules. Yeah, should be. Here's our aircraft. It is not very good drawing the airplanes. Look, should be in sight of the ground and clear of cloud. Below three thousand feet, in sight of the cloud. In sight of the ground and clear of cloud, and mic lights, uh, paramotors, paragliders should be have at least 1,500 meters visibility that way. It's not a lot when you think about it. If you look on a misty day and think how far one one and a half kilometers is. When we stand here and we can see the other side of the racetrack from if you've ever been to Darlymore and you go well that's about one and a half kilometres and you think oh, do I want to fly around in that at 80 miles an hour or even 20 miles an hour, it's not a lot. And of course visibility as we know on a misty day as you go up the visibility will just get worse so it cuts it down. Um, Above 3,000 feet, an aircraft or a, a microlite should be 1,000 feet, yes, 1,000 feet, 1,000 feet clear of cloud above and below. And once again, one point. 1,500 meters horizontally visibility around them. A, a G, an aircraft traveling, a GA aircraft is 5K. 5K, it's yeah, 5K. yeah. In flight visibility of 5K. Yeah. 1,500 meters clear above. Yeah. So, 5K. For a, a GA aircraft, general aviation aircraft, is actually five kilometres. And that's because of the faster speeds they generally travel. Yeah. So it's 5k for those above 3,000 feet. And that's up to 10,000 feet or flight level. So the upper limit on that, then it changes again, yeah, is 10,000 feet, which the majority of us don't often fly above 10,000 feet, and that's when in Namibia. <laughs> or India. Or India, yeah. Or in the Alps. But very rare in the UK that we would fly above 10,000 feet. That would be an exceptional day out in the UK if we even approached 10,000 feet. <laughs> Is that Avon calling? <laughs> Mr. Dawes! <laughs> Why is he not watching? Well, he might be watching, he's just trying to correct me now. Oh yeah, someone, someone's quite correctly uh, prompted out that the CA has replaced Class F airspace. Well, they haven't replaced it, it's to be uh, reassigned. There is still Class F air routes down the south but yes you're right you're right uh steve it has uh, it has been it's been reassigned it's been yeah. parceled out yes yeah. there's everything there's things so that's probably been put on hold like everything else though you know. <laughs> uh is there anything else mark you'd like to 
Um, no, we, we, the questions are coming through. Yeah, any questions? It's 10 to now, we've been on just shortly now. Do we need to be BHPA to fly here? Yes, we do. Yes, it, it, it was our policy, that's our insurance. Really, so it's our third party insurance. If you do want to come over to a BHPA rating, uh, we can do that quite easily for you if you want to come on. If you're already a pilot um, and you want to come and fly here, if you're a paramotor pilot, it, it mainly is the paramotor pilots who ask me that question. Do I have to be a BHPA? You have to be a BHPA member. Yes, that's our, but we're a BHPA recognised school. So, yes, a BHPA member. Oh, Jan wants the nodder joke. You're not allowed to tell a naughty joke. <laughs> it's not water, Chad. Yeah, yeah not the water. <laughs> it's not the clock. It's not the clock. Yeah, I'm not allowed to tell a naughty joke, Chad. We'll, we'll do that on YouTube version. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell. I'll, I'll tell you the naughty joke the next time I see you. Okay. All right, guys. That's about it for me. I hope that's um, a bit of a refresher for you. Some of you may have not seen the right hand rules before. Uh, Anti-collision rules. Um, Learn them, know them. They should be in your head like this. Who's who's got right of way here? You know, but the overriding rule is avoid collision at all costs and do everything you can to avoid that collision. Um, Are the rules international? No. Now this is. Um, they're not international. These are about, these are the UK ones. A lot of the rules are the same internationally. Yes, they are, but some of the more uh, uh, specific rules, like overtaking on ridges and stuff like that, will vary from sport to sport and from country to country. So that's when, if you do fly abroad, it's good to have a local site guide and ask these questions. What are the rules? because you'll go and visit France, you'll go to the Alps, and all of a sudden you'll think, hang on, no one's obeying the rule about overtaking, what's it? That's because their rule's different, or they haven't got that rule, and they're flying in different type of conditions where they, they're not actually ridge soaring. So they're actually, so the answer is yes, they're common rules, but no, they're not international. Hmm? Thank you guys, thank you. Thanks Andy and guys, we really appreciate you once again tuning in uh, and listening to the ramblings of some madmen. Um, some great feedback that came through uh, on their comments saying that they, uh, they weren't lost already so that must be a, must be a good thing. Um, the overriding thing with air law to bear in mind, and this has been relevant with some of the questions where people are going, oh I thought it was, air law changes. It could be changing now as we speak. It takes one incident for the current air law to be completely obliterated um, and a new one invented for it. The CAA produced this ANO, it's a government uh, binding document that they uh, produce uh, to the government to say on how they're going to keep the airway safe. So a prime one, we got a couple of ones saying, I thought it was 3K. Yes, it used to be 3K for things like microlights. It was always one and a half K, but what they did is they reduced that down for microlight class so that we have a minimum in flight visibility below 3,000 feet now of one and a half K, 1,500 meters. But as Andy says, you wouldn't choose to do that. It was done so that you could get back, so that you could land in that field if you needed to. Uh, and another clarification that um, above 3,000 feet, you need to have a minimum in flight visibility of 5k, so the general vis uh, of 5k, but you must remain 1500 meters vertically from cloud. So if you were flying down the street, you must be 1500 meters away from it and inside of the ground at all times. And that's something that a lot of people get confused um, about. They think, I can see some land over there. The inside of the ground bit is for navigation. 
Because you can see a spot of green over there and you are following a compass heading doesn't mean that you're going in the right direction. We've already discussed uh, about sat navs and using iPads. That's the time that they turn off. Anyway, we all have varying handbooks that we use. Um, they all are of varying editions. The Air Law is current at the time. These are current at the time of print. If you're unsure, please make sure you're a member of a good club that will keep qualified pilots uh, up to date on any changes of things like air laws um, so that you remain safe. Remember, it is the ultimate responsibility of the pilot in command to prevent plummeting. And that's pretty much air law in a nutshell. Thou shalt not plummet. Anyway. We hope to be back again on Friday. Um, I think we're going to revisit some more um, meteorology. Uh, I think we're going to be a bit more specific than just the, uh, it's, uh, the sun shines, the water rises and then it rains, all those clouds. So we're going to try and be a bit more specialised on some meteorology for you. Specifically, obviously looking more to do with pilots uh, and weather hazardous to flight. So hopefully we'll see you all again on Friday. If you do, are you watching this again uh, on a um, re rewind or, or watch it or catch up, then please feel free to still comment. We do read all the comments. If you have anything that you'd like to ask us specifically, then please do message us via our Facebook and either myself and your Barry will get back to you. But again, thanks ever so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you on Friday. Stay safe, stay well, stay at home.